thank you all for coming. And uh, I want to start by asking, and I know we're not interactive, but you can you can uh, just contemplate this. And I was at want to ask if anybody knows what this is. And the reason I'm asking that is not to um, put you on the spot, but it's because I didn't know what it was for a very long time. And it was in our house on Vinyl Haven when we bought the house in 1987. It came furnished the way that island houses do, including a wood stove in the living room. And the tool that I just showed you was right next to the fireplace tongs. So for the longest time, I thought it was for wrestling logs. You know, you'd pick it up and pull out a log or move it around. I was wrong. It was an essential fishing tool called a gaff used for pulling big fish out of the water and into the boat. And this one was likely made by an island blacksmith and may have been used by someone in the house since at some point a fisherman lived um, in this house, which no longer, when we owned it, had waterfront, but had, I think, in the 19th century. Um, however, the owners before us collected things. So as with so much of history, I really don't know its origins. Um, I do know its purpose. And I use it as an example um, of just how ignorant I was about Vinyl Haven as a summer person and how writing this book for me was this evolution um, and the book was a gift because I changed the way I understood the island. So I set out to write this book um, after we'd had a summer home on the island for 25 years, because one day Bodine Ames, then in her 70s, a lifetime Fox Island resident who took care of many houses, including ours, told me that she could remember as a child picking up scallops from the water to make chowder. And in a flash, I found myself wondering what Vinyl Haven had been like when fish and other creatures, scallops, clams, all those, um, and other than lobsters, were abundant. And I really felt this urgency to try to touch a rapidly disappearing world. So I sought to understand the fishing history of the island, but also something about what we mean when we talk about an island fishing community and to shift the lens slightly, what it also means when a community is surrounded by the ocean and the ocean is full of fish. What are all the ways that fish play a part in people's lives? And the book includes a whole lot about that. Um, Bodine made a list of the oldest fishermen who she thought I should interview immediately. Um, this was back before 2010, 29, somewhere in there. And so I was on my way. I had no idea I was embarking on a decade long project. I ended up conducting 50 formal interviews, pursuing hundreds of conversations, reading books galore and spending many, many days um, in the archives on the island um, in the historical society there and then up and down the coast, including a visit or two to the Penobscot Marine Museum, which is wonderful for those of you who may not spend time there. I assume most of you know it better than I do, but I was a, am a big fan. Um, and I quickly learned how partially, incompletely, I'd seen the, I'd been seeing the island. It kind of stuns me in retrospect. I loved Vinyl Haven for its peace and quiet, its raspberry bushes and chanterelle, its swimming holes and profound beauty. I enjoyed all the islanders I met. I watched fishermen lobstering and I was lucky enough to go out hauling a few times. Um, I knew how important lobstering was and, uh, and is to the economy. Yet somehow I had stayed completely blind to Vinyl Haven's significant fishing history. The quiet little island that is not even nine miles long has been home to fishermen and their families for 5,000 years. Then millennia later, after the end of the American Revolution, starting in small ways in the 1790s, but in earnest in the 1820s, Vinyl Haven coasters and schooners delivered first smoked herring and later salt cod, mostly to Boston from where it was shipped all over the world, but occasionally the island vessels took it directly to the Caribbean and to the American South, where it often, by the by, fed enslaved people, though not exclusively. Some of the, the immigrant population coming into America 
bought a lot of smoked fish too. And, and many people who just didn't have a lot of money bought it. In the 1850s, when Maine caught half the nation's cod, Vinyl Haven was the second biggest codfish port in Maine. Had you visited the island in 1855, you would have seen a very busy harbor with men and women working everywhere. And according to the Good Report, 90 to 100 fishing boats sailing to banks near and far. The double-ended pinky was one favorite style island vessel um, because it wasn't expensive to make. But you'd, if you were there in 1855, you'd see codfish drying racks everywhere, smoke ha houses too, since island fishermen caught or bought herring, smoked it, and boxed it. There'd be barrels getting filled with mackerel that fishermen had toiled and jigged to catch. And lobsters, because starting in the 1840s, a lobster smack came to Vinyl Haven. Smacks were boats with wet wells, which allowed lobsters to survive transport to Portland, Boston, and New York. Um, before that, there had there had been no way because lobsters can't be killed, they can't be preserved um, or they couldn't be for freezing. Um, so that you needed the wet well with a fresh, with the seawater coming through it all the time to keep them alive so you could transfer them. And that's what created market value for them. One historian wrote that the lobster smacked captain was welcome only if he brought jugs of rum to the eager fishermen. In the book, I described the particulars of each of these fisheries, who fished, how they fished, who traded the fish and so forth. I have a chapter that annotates a set of mid-century letters between an unsuccessful fisherman and his wife that I found in the archives uh, in the historical society. Later in the late 19th century, in first decades of the 20th century, Vinyl Haven was the home to the biggest fish processing plant in Maine, and one of the largest in the United States. Fishermen delivered cod, hake, haddock, pollock, among others. The catch was iced, frozen, or occasionally still salted and shipped everywhere. While fish stocks rose and fell, and human fishing continually pressured them, it wasn't until the second half of the 20th century the technology got the better of the fish around the island and really worldwide. In the 1990s, life changed radically on Vinyl Haven, though thanks to the abundant lobsters, lobstermen really began to thrive. But what has been had been forever a multi-species year-round fin fish fishery suddenly became a monoculture. Herb Conway, an island fisherman born in 1926 and now deceased, was the son and grandson of island fishermen. When we spoke in 2015, he quickly summed up the situation on the island. Quote, it's unbelievable how something could be so great and then be nil. I never thought you would not be able to buy a fish on Vinyl Haven, a fresh fish. So, when the island had fish is the story of 500 years in the life of a fishing community, where it started and where it is now. It explores the history of the island, the violent struggles during the colonial era over who controlled the resources in the Penobscot Bay, Vinyl Haven's eventual settlement by European colonists, and the early 19th century birth of its fishing industry. It follows island fishing to the present, the, the book mostly focuses on stories about the people who lived on Vinyl Haven. It's their story. Theirs has been a challenging life filled with constant risk and is held together by hard work, hope for the next good catch, many kinship ties, and a strong community, good ocean resources, and great adaptive resourcefulness among the people. Additionally, not often mentioned when we think about the independent island fishing life, the cod fishing success was initially enabled by a well-placed government cod fishing subsidy. And later, many centuries, a couple uh, century and a half later, islanders were greatly aided by WPA money during the Great Depression. 
and in various other ways since. So the island has always been at once really separate and totally connected to the rest of Maine and America. I want mostly to tell you stories I heard from island fishermen, but first let me acknowledge the long, pre rich pre-European island history of human habitation. About 4,500 years ago, a group of ancestors of today's Wabanaki Confederacy, not the earliest human inhabitants, but the first who left plentiful evidence of their lives, settled on North Haven and Vinyl Haven to fish. Bruce Bork and his team of archeologists have lately referred to them as the swordfish hunters, though for a long time they were referred to as the red paint people. They lived year round on both islands, though younger men returned to the mainland sometimes in spring and summer, probably to hunt. On the islands, they fished and hunted, sewed clothing and carved tools. The swordfish hunters carefully buried their dead, both humans and pet dogs. It was a sophisticated, knowledgeable culture. I urge you to read Bork's books about them as well as commentaries by members of the Wabanaki Confederacy. And I want simply to say three things about them relevant to fish and fishing and later island history. These very early inhabitants likely came to the islands because fish were so abundant in the Gulf of Maine. We know that they fished for codfish and caught ones that were much bigger, up to four to five feet long, than any caught by living fishermen and living memory. They appear to have been superb canoeists and they paddled their dugout canoes into deep ocean to pursue swordfish. Nobody's quite sure why, maybe just because swordfish were delicious, but they think uh, Bruce Bork speculates that it might've been for ritual reasons um, as well for you know the, the race, the competition, the strength required, the manly uh, outing and so forth. But it's uh, perhaps the womanly outing, we don't know, but it's unclear uh, what made them pursue for swordfish, but we know from what was in the middens that they did. And what's so interesting is swordfish didn't come that close in. You had to really go out into deep water to get them, whereas there were so many fish they could have that were close in. Finally, we know from the bones found in middens, the large shell piles that are all over the Atlantic coastal ecotome, and that by the way, have been um, really hurt in the recent January storm. And if you see, thing, see one and see things coming out of it, you're asked to uh, report them and save those things because uh, it's, a, it's a bad time for middens and they're invaluable in what they contain. But we know from these middens that they fished for and consumed many, many sea creatures cod, swordfish, winter flounder, smooth flounder, sculpin, pollock, herring, dogfish, haddocks, clams, and mussels, among others. Interestingly, it seems that a two, the, the swordfish hunters, gradually fished down the cod stock in the waters around the islands. The cod bones got smaller in more recent midden levels, so even 7,000 years, several thousand years ago, when we can uh, look back on these middens, we can already see humans putting pressure on a local Penobscot Bay cod stock. So across millennia, the Fox Islands, uh, principally Vinyl Haven, North Haven, and Matinicus, were places groups likely mostly of Penobscot, but also possibly from three other principal Eastern Algonquin nations, the Mi'kmaq, the Maliseet, and the Passamaquoddy, now broadly known as the Wabanaki Confederacy, came to live sometimes and often to hunt, fish, clam, gather birds' eggs for food, and to gather grasses with which to weave baskets. Um, in recent living, almost living memory too, they would get dolphins for the oil for lamps. Their practices were interrupted as Europeans arrived, seeking to control the land and fishing grounds and exposing these groups to more violence and to deadly illnesses that they had no resistance to. The book has a chapter about some of the struggles around the Fox Islands for control over fish and other resources, and a chapter about my own effort to track down and visit three very old skeletons unearthed on Vinyl Haven in 1939 
when hunting for relics was a national phenomenon. And I write about what relic hunting was about. Um, one additional thought, the bloody struggle between the Penobscot and the colonists was an origin point and literally a DNA source for one major strand of the Vinyl Haven fishing community. In 1751, a man named Ebenezer Hall settled on Matinicus, a smaller island further out to sea than Vinyl Haven. To better graze his cattle, he burned off nearby Green's Island, which by treaty was to be left unburned for use by the Penobscot. A group of Penobscot appealed to colonial authorities for help, but after several years, when they got none, they took matters into their own hands and laid siege to Hall's, the Hall family, and after 10 days killed Ebenezer Hall. His widow, Mary, whose remarkable story I recount in the book, lived, I think, till 89 after many adventures, and two of his sons did too. So in 1763, when the British decisively defeated the French, the tiny handful of living Penobscot were forced to resettle on an area around Old Town, Maine. The historian Horace Beck suggests that there were about 500 people left alive then. But at that time, Ebenezer Hall Jr., one of the two sons who had lived, returned with his wife to Matinicus. The couple had 15 children, all of whom grew up and married, often to Vinyl Haven settlers. Ebenezer Hall Jr., who lived to 80, and his wife and children are the ancestors of many people lobstering on the island today. And, you know, initially when Vinyl Haven was made into a community um, after the revolution, Vinyl Haven, North Haven, and Matinicus were joined together for a while. One example of the Hall descendants is that in 1776, Thaddeus Carver married Hannah Hall, a granddaughter of Ebenezer Hall Sr. Hannah worked at some point as a midwife. She died in 1848 at the age of 89. In an undated letter, her great-granddaughter wrote, quote, my grandmother always spoke of Hannah as a very strong, capable woman. Once, two fishermen came over to Vinyl Haven in a small sailing vessel to get her to go to Matinicus to attend a woman in childbirth. On the way over, the fishermen got drunk and she bound them up with ropes, locked them in the hold of the boat and took the boat across by herself. My grandmother also remembered seeing her many times go outside our house and shoot a wild duck on the wing. One of the reasons I love this story is that it's so emblematic of, of so many island women and that capacity to, to meet any situation, not, not always easily, but to meet them and to do what it took. Um, many of the first settlers of Vinyl Haven were civic-minded folks from the Cape Cod area. Mayflower descendants, many of them, and others who are not knew a lot about community and starting townships and civic order, how to get schools going and churches, how to govern, how to build roads and boats and mill lumber, et cetera. They had moved up because the Mass Bay area was running out of land and because Maine was so um, contested until the middle 1760s, there was more land available for Europeans once that those wars ended. Um, but there's the other settler strand might best be called piratical. Men and women, kind of like Ebenezer Hall, um, also really competent, who wanted to tend to their lives on their own terms and to be left alone, and who felt that one reason to settle on a rocky, cold island was to stay out from under mainland law and all law. Now, both these temperaments are alive and well, probably everywhere in the world in some ways, and maybe in all of us to a certain extent, we have some of each of these qualities, um, but they're certainly alive and well today on Vinyl Haven and the Islanders I know embrace them. Uh, so the first part of the book presents a careful study of island history through the Second World War. 
I show how islanders started fishing in the early 19th century when the island fishing industry, uh, what the island fishing industry looked like at its peak in the mid 19th century and how it had an initial decline after the end of the civil war, but stayed in the game nonetheless. Motors arrived during the first decade of the 20th century and changed fishing forever. So these chapters use letters and journal excerpts by Islanders, as well as newspaper accounts and old records to paint a fuller picture. And also I had uh, the wonderful assistance um, of a uh, woman who worked editing my uh, uh, fishing knowledge because she's a fishing expert. Um, and I thank her in the book. Um, but here are three examples to give you a little texture. Uh, the first is from Captain David Carver, writing to his parents in 1857 from New Orleans, loading for Liverpool. Quote, I never worked harder than aboard this ship. 20 men to look after and keep straight. And you know how discipline on shipboard is needful, the first thing. I have to do it to get them afeard of me, and then all is well. But I have had no difficulty. Only one morning they refused to turn to after I got on the river. When I shot one of them and threatened the rest, and finally they thought it better to work, which they did very quiet. So in case we want to see that world is not violent, we probably sh should understand that it was uh, a pretty rough and ready world. Vera Johnson, a second story, born in 1895, reminiscing about her childhood. Quote, I remember the big boats that brought salt. The boats would be anchored in the harbor. In the evening, you could hear the sailors singing and violins playing. And I've read uh, other accounts uh, along the North, of the North Atlantic coast uh, off New Hampshire and Maine of, of singing in harbors and how in the evening one, one person on one boat might start out and another on another boat might answer. Um, it's a wonderful image, I think. Um, or this news story from uh, April, 1915, David W. Laurie, and Sidney E. Laurie left this port on a trawling expedition one week ago Saturday in a 15-foot dory. A heavy northeast storm overtook them and probably blew the frail craft to sea. David, 46, left a wife and three children. Sidney, 37, was single. Later, they were found locked in each other's arms in the dory having starved to death. A third brother, James, had died at sea 11 years earlier. And I wanna mention, use this story as a way to mention how relentless death at sea was, how relentless. Um, so many families lost one person and then another person and then another person. Um, and if you look in the cemeteries, you'll see this and uh, it's in the family letters and journals. It was a life that uh, just had so much loss in it. The second, and that began to shift as the technology improved, you know, um, and it's not over, but it, it certainly uh, got better proportionately to how many people go to see. The second part of the book is more about what living Islanders remember. It tells all about the men, the women, the children, the community, and the fish. A few themes from it would be one, the first of all, the year-round seasonal patterns of fishing for multiple species. So I have fishermen lead us through the four seasons as they were lived until very lately, um, from clams in early spring to scallops in winter back around. Um, and secondly, how the fishing community was sustained as much by the labor of women as by men. Um, thirdly, the strong sense people had that the poverty that mostly accompanied fishing mattered little since everyone was in the same boat. And I heard that expression over and over interviewing people. 
Um, so often people will say to me, you know, we didn't know we were poor. Everybody was in the same boat. It just didn't matter. Um, and how the sense of being in it together carried people through so much. And then fourth, the radical 20th century uh, technology revolution, which brought better motors, sonar, synthetic nets, eventually huge factory ships. Before that, refrigeration, freezing, international competition of a new sort, ever evolving government regulations. And finally, this privatization of the ocean and the way uh, these forces gradually not only emptied really the, the, the Penobscot Bay and the Gulf of Maine, uh, uh, but left island fishermen without licenses except for lobstering, at least for now. I mean, there are a few exceptions, but by and large, that's the nature of it. During the 20th century, the salted cod, the island's specialty, gave way to a fresh and frozen fish market. The island had many, many small factories, as well as the big one I described. Uh, the, they were always turning over, they were disappearing and appearing, and sometimes they canned lobster or clams, sometimes they later did frozen uh, fish and lobsters, um, bait. The Great Depression hit the island really hard, as it did for so much of America. Um, many men and women left for work and then fought in World War II but they returned home to good fishing for haddock, cod, redfish, hake, and herring. And then it on and off continued into the 1990s. And just a note for a minute about the fighting uh, in World War II. You know, since the island was settled, it's uh, really disproportionately sent um, people off to serve in wars. And you might know you might that one of the reasons the cod subsidy was first put in place um, in uh, when the United States started was, first of all, to thank uh, the Maine fishermen for participating in the revolution and often losing boats and helping to fight the British. Um, but secondly, to keep to make sure that people kept being sailors because you needed sailors for your Navy and fishermen make great sailors. Um, so much so that uh, one of the 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 dire boys uh, in World War Two. Uh, was on a submarine and uh, his commander could not believe how far off he could spot tiny things in the water. And of course it was because he was so used to looking for buoys in fog and uh, he, he figured he had trained his eyes. So let me tell you a few stories. One day in uh, 207, I went out with a friend and his sternman for a day of lobstering. I baited a few bait bags and before long was violently seasick. Um, it was an embarrassing seven hours, but I remembered it when I started interviewing older island fishermen and it led me to ask them about their own experiences and then to ask them how as children they had learned to fish. And, and here are a few recollections. Uh, Bert Dyer, who lived from 1922 to 2011 recalled Quote, I had lobster traps out when I was eight years old and I had a license for a dollar and I had an old pea pod that I bought from Al Miller for three dollars. And my grandfather helped me put some new timbers in it and I used to row and I had about 50 traps out. If you, if you don't know, a pea pod is sort of a, is a two ended pointed ended boat. Um, in the shape of a pea pod that was very popular with fishermen. It held traps well, it rolled well in the water and they could row it standing up backwards or forwards. Or Ivan Olson said, uh, who was lived from 1926 to 2013, um, he didn't wanna be a stone cutter like his dad. Remember, of course, granite was the other big island uh, industry in the late 19th century. And uh, he found a fisherman up the street who took him under his wing. Um, quote, Herbie would tell me when he was gonna go out in the morning, you know, four or 4.30 a.m. And I knew where he went from and I'd walk over and everything and I'd be there. Most of the time I was asleep down on the wharf waiting for him. We'd go and I'd help him if I could. I was just a little fella anyway, probably 10 years old. Sonny Warren, 
who lived from 1929 to 2022, these, these men were long lived, um, described how his son started with him. Quote, I don't know. He was probably four years old. I used to take him fishing. He recalled how the boy loved to come with him and how he'd lift him onto a lobster crate so he could reach the steering and help steer. Many fishermen said that they couldn't recall when they first learned to manage oars or a motorboat. They tagged along with their fathers or grandfathers and picked up skills bit by bit. There was a lot of informal teaching, sometimes kind, other times with an edge, when older fishermen attempted to teach youngsters just how cold and how much cold and wet and seasickness they'd have to endure to stay in the game. Kids often started out by dressing fish. As a 10 year old, Jerry Dowdy went out with his father and grandfather and his job was to quote, cut the heads off and take the guts out. So he would slice the hake open and reach his arm into the big body, quote, that's when I would get seasick. The first hake, because hake blow up, the air lets go and the smell of it, that would put me, get me every time. He said, but you didn't stop no matter how sick you got, quote, you couldn't stop, you wouldn't get paid. The book also talks in detail about the species of fish, the cod, the haddock, the heron, herring, the hake, the pollock, the redfish, caught, and the amounts and the ways of fishing, long line, trawl, purse signs, and dragging and closing off coves and building weirs and about the bycatch waste of a multi-species fishery, the buyers, the difficulties finding markets, but for tonight, just a few broader comments and stories. Island fishermen worked incredibly hard, especially from the spring well into the autumn. The work was exhausting and brutal before boats came with motors and winches to haul in the trawl and the nets. It had to be hand hauled and injuries were constant and social uh, shoulder bursitis ended many a man's trawling. Storms came out of nowhere, and in a few minutes, fishermen could lose their fishing equipment and the year's earnings if they didn't out and out get drowned. There was just no good weather forecasting for the longest time. Bert Dyer described, for one specific, um, the hazard of dogfish. The sharks that arrived in July took the hooks and had to be unhooked from the trawl one at a time. And they would thrash you in the process and they ruined the fishing. He called them, quote, green eyed bastards. And he claimed to have once been so infuriated by their attacking his lines that he bit the nose off one. Um, and he was certain the arthritis in his shoulder was from pounding the dogfish. Ivan Olson recalled baiting with fresh herring for cod and getting cusk instead when the, you hauled up the trawl. Quote, and we came in and of course they wasn't worth nothing, probably a couple of cents a pound. We had 6,000 or 7,000 pounds of the damn things. We had an awful struggle to get rid of cusk because they were, there were plenty of haddock around. So if there hadn't been haddock um, to go to market, which was what the market wanted first, they could have sold the cusk. But because there was lots of haddock, if you caught cusk, you couldn't sell it, but you never knew. So it was a really hard piece of work to figure it um, and to survive it. John Beckman, who lived from 1919 to 2010, I interviewed him when he was 90 and he looked back fondly remembering his work clamming. He said, it was hard work, but geez, it was fun. And during the 1930s, he was an astounding clam digger, managing eight or 10 or more bushels in a day, an unheard of amount. Sonny Oakes, who lived from 1925 to 2012, who dug with him sometimes, remembered John's experience differently. He said, they claim, but I didn't see him at the time, that he dug so hard that he'd crawl up on the bank and throw up. Of course, he had a big family, six or seven kids, so he had to dig that hard. 
A fisherman I call Hal, a generation younger than John Beckman and some of the others I've named, described a work day where he left port at four in the afternoon, slept an hour on the boat on the way to the fishing ground, and another hour on the way home. He arrived home with daylight between four or five in the morning and unloaded fish with his the crew he was fishing with. He'd grab breakfast, and then he'd go out and haul his lobster traps until noon. So after 20 hours of work, he'd go home, watch a half hour of television, sleep for two hours, eat supper, and set out again. And he kept this up for 30 years. The fishermen had to earn livings, but many loved the work, found it genuinely exciting. You never knew what the next day would bring. And the joy was when you caught a boatload. Walt Day remembered an exhilarating day in the 1960s when he was a teenager out with a friend. He said, one day, just to the west of Hurricane Ledges, we had like 900 pounds of cod in the outboard boat. We had so many codfish in the outboard boat that we would catch one and we'd have to dress it to make more room in the boat because it was pretty nearly filled up. And the fishermen who loved the work, they really loved it. Lee Osgood, fishing for herring as a teenager, described going out just before dark when you get your best sets um, and looking for the herring schools. And he remembered, you look for porpoises, gulls. If you've never been and seen a school of herring, it's a sight to behold. It's just like a sheet. They whiten. It's just super. If they're really solid, it's unreal. Just as far as you can see. Beautiful, it really is. On a pretty night, it's beautiful. You could smell them. There's nothing like it. Purse seining is quite addicting when everything is going good, which lots of nights it did, lots of nights it didn't. It's just typical fishing, but it was beautiful. The fish in the water, the guys all working together, having a good time. A real simple good time. Like I said, nobody probably had a $10 bill in their wallet, but nobody really cared. You didn't think about stuff like that. Islanders knew how to enjoy themselves in spite of everything. Men in the fish houses or on the water, women knitting nets together, working in the fish plants or in restaurants, talking over everything and laughing a lot together. I quote a lot of the camaraderie, it was for real. A woman who worked in one of the island's many fish plants recalled that she had to wear gloves when filleting the fish because the fish are slippery. Sometimes your hands get tired because some of the fish are big. It's like anything when you're doing it all day long, you get tired. Still, it was always a fun thing because we were always laughing and singing songs and listening to the music and doing things like that. It wasn't just a job. Everybody was talking. There's so much more I could relate, but I'll leave you to read it for yourself should you decide you want to. While I have tried hard not to soften too many edges and I don't want to romanticize a life that was also challenging and dangerous and deadly, still, I think we would be losing so much if we lose our appreciation for what it means to work together um, and pursue wild creatures like the swordfish hunters did 5,000 years ago, like native fishermen did for thousands of years, and as islanders have done for hundreds of years. Um, as we try to imagine what a collective future might look like, there's a lot to be learned from Vinyl Haven and communities like it, where people had to figure out how to get along and how to work and disagree and celebrate and mourn together, and where they had to solve so many problems with ingenuity and bailing wire. We sold our house in 2018, but I took the gap that I showed you. Bodhi Names, who inspired this book, died in 2019, and I'd like to give her the last word. When I interviewed her, I asked her about going smelting, you know, smelt or small, fish that used to come into the fresh water, an anadromous fish um, until, well, until the mid 20th century, they when they stopped coming to Vinyl Haven, 
and inland, one favorite, I think because they were disappearing, one favorite town activity was gathering at an inlet or a stream on a spring night uh, when they would come in uh, to mate. And they were small fish. They tasted, people tell me, a little like a small salmon. Bodine remembered going smelting as a little girl in the late 1930s. And she wrote, she told me, quote, it was so exciting because we watched the stars and we could actually see the glimmer of the smelt as they flipped up the brook to go and spawn. The tide would be almost high. There would be several groups of people and we'd all be talking quietly and it was fun. There were some people from Vinyl Haven and some from North Haven. God knows who might be there. Old people too. Some were out in their pea pods or tenders and they could reach over the side and fish that way. Everyone waited and waited. Then suddenly someone would hear something and rush to the brook and everyone followed. And she said, we would use our flashlights then. They had them, but they hadn't turned them on till that moment. And when you would just see a flick or a glimmer, you just reach in and you'd get that smelt and he'd be wiggling in your hand. And it felt enormous to me. Then you put it in a bucket. Everybody had buckets. You know, if we got a bucket of smelts, that was a whole lot of smelts and we could share it with the neighborhood. A lot of times, if it wasn't too, too late, say it was only 1030 or 11 at night, whoever was there smelting with you, you might say, well, this is the first smelts of the season. Why don't you come home and have some with me? After cleaning them, Bodine's family rolled them in cornmeal and fried them in bacon fat or lard. They were wonderful, she recalled.